Okay, we're ready to begin. It looks like we have another great crowd tonight, and we're really happy that you all came. We're going to um, have two topics, primary topics this evening, and then we're going to end the last 30 minutes with an opportunity for you to tell us what you thought about the series and also then for you to find out about the public deliberation sessions that are coming up and um, to give us some idea of what you think you might like to see happen from this point on. I want to remind you that um, you can stay up to date on all that's happening with this series by going to universityconnections.com. Uh, we have videos of all the sessions there, slides of all of the different presentations, the community questions and comments that you provided us on February 3rd at our kickoff, as many as 750 distinctive uh, comments and questions. And that's where you'll find links to educational materials that we have provided to give you some supplementary information since it's been really hard to cover everything in these few short hours. And that's also where you can RSVP for the del deliberation sessions. I want to take the opportunity to uh, point out that it was because of University Connections and the Community Foundation of, of um, Northern Colorado that we're even doing this tonight. They are the ones who asked those of us at CSU to help them. And I want to um, ask Jim Reedhead to stand and wave so that you know who he is. He's the director of University Connections. He's back there in the back. So, Okay, well, we're ready to dig right in. The, t the first topic tonight is permitting of projects like the two projects that are, are, in, are proposed for our area. Rena Brand from the U U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is going to give this presentation, and then we will have time for a question and answer session after she finishes. So, Rena, before Rena starts, I want to tell you what's going to happen next because I don't have the opportunity for you to see the slides after I put her slides up. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you that the next topic then will be where will future water come from, a look at urban water conservation. And you can see the titles there of Lori Diodney and John Monson. And then um, we're going to have Martine Carcasson and Leah Sprain lead us in this last part about where do we go from here. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Brina Brand, and I'm with the Corps of Engineers, and I work right here in Colorado. I work in an office down in Littleton, and our office covers this whole northeast portion of Colorado, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, Mary Lou invited me today to talk about regulatory process. I know that's an extremely exciting topic, <laughs> but, but I hope you'll bear with me, and I hope I can boil this down to something that we can all kind of understand, and I'm um, excited to hear um, what your questions are later. Um, at any rate, I um, would like to talk about regulatory process, so uh, here we go. Can everybody hear me in the back okay? Okay, I'm getting some nods, so that's good. Okay, so what I want to tell you about today is why the core is involved in the first place. I know a lot of folks have that question in general. And then we'll go through that regulatory process, and I've boiled it down to 10 steps. So hopefully that's pretty easy to remember. Then I'm going to talk just a little bit about the status of some of these water supply EISs you might know about around here. And then I'll point out some facts and some important points for you to remember. Okay, so let's talk first about why the Corps of Engineers is involved in the first place. And uh, before I even go through these bullets, I want to point something out to you. You'll see here that I'm always talking about core regulatory. Core regulatory. Uh, you know, the Corps of Engineers is a, is a very large organization. Um, has a lot of different goals, a lot of different missions. And you might know us from uh, seeing us on TV. Maybe we're helping out with a flood, disaster relief. Um, maybe we're constructing an army base somewhere. So certainly the Corps of Engineers as an agency has a lot of different missions. And this one, Corps Regulatory, is a specific branch in the Corps of Engineers. It's very unique. 
And it's also quite new. It came about as a result of the Clean Water Act, which I think you guys might recognize that. You've been learning about that. That came about in 1972. And Congress decided to uh, task that to the Corps of Engineers to protect our nation's uh, rivers and wetlands. Okay, So Corps regulatory is a very specific branch that doesn't have a mission to engineer things, but rather um, to evaluate and regulate what's going on. So the reason Corps regulatory gets involved in the first place is really as simple as this. Any proposed placement of fill material, okay, into a river or wetland would require a review by the core regulatory program. Okay, and as I said, that's a result of the Clean Water Act. And the whole goal of this is to protect the physical, chemical, and biological quality of the nation's waters. So that, that's the primary goal there. Okay, so here's how it works. Uh, when the Corps receives a permit application, this would be a proposal. This is before any work starts, okay? A permit application comes to us, and that first question that we look at is, what is the placement of fill in the stream or wetland, okay? Then the next question we look at is, okay, how big or how significant are those impacts? Okay, and we have various thresholds for that that we look at. And then that last question we ask ourselves is, okay, how, what level do we review this at? What level of review? Okay, so those are the very first initial things that happen when we receive a, an application. So let me talk to you a little bit about those levels of review, because that starts to come into play about why we do environmental impact statements, okay? So very uh, small impacts, I'm talking about less than a tenth of an acre of wetland, that, that's about uh, 4,000 square feet, really. It, it's, it's maybe about the size of the front of this room right here. If the impact is less than that, we do just a small review, and that gets uh, what we call a general permit. Okay, it's a streamlined review. Uh, it's meant to be streamlined so as not to be too much of a, a burden for these smaller projects, okay? Now, in our office, we, we probably review about anywhere from uh, 300 to 500 permit applications a year. So 95% of them fall into this small review category, okay? That gives you an idea of what we're doing every day is these small things. Okay, then the next level of review, I'll just call it a medium review, that's called an environmental assessment, EA, we say. And that usually ends up taking us about four months. And we dive in deeper into some of the issues of how that project might be impacting wetlands or waters. Um, here in the Denver metro area and up into all along the Front Range, really, we have a lot of development going on. So housing development is a big one in our office, and we probably review, those make up about maybe 5% or so of, of the reviews we do on an annual basis. We might do about 30 EAs in our office, okay? And so, here's the big one. The largest level of review that we do is an environmental impact statement, EIS. Okay, and so that's what you all might be familiar with with regard to these, uh, these proposals that, that we're discussing through these forums, uh, NISP, which is Northern Integrated Supply Project, and Halligan Seaman, those are both EIS level reviews, and those can take years. Okay, those can take years, and, and I'll show you how long it's taking, and you'll get an idea of that. But with an EIS, the difference that, that breaks it from these others is uh, public involvement. Okay, so that's what's unique and important about an EIS is it's so important and um, it's so valuable and interesting to the public that we get the public involved with it. Okay, now what I'd also like to emphasize is core regulatory is a completely independent reviewer of these proposals. We are that independent party looking at all of these issues and all of these questions. So I've heard some folks say, maybe they're confused about why the core was involved, and they said, oh, the core is assisting uh, the proponent with the project. No, 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 that's not it. <laughs> oh, the core wants to build it. No, 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 that's not it. 
core regulatory is completely independent. Um, we look at this uh, under a scientific method kind of process, and uh, we have no influence by proponents or other groups. We're, we're looking at this um, with a keen eye and, and no bias. Um, and so our goal as we go through the CIS process is to follow NEPA. I don't know if you guys have heard about NEPA. It's the National Environmental Policy Act and the Clean Water Act merged together. Okay, that's what happens with an EIS is we're merging those laws together. And I would also like to add that um, core regulatory provides no federal funding for these proposals. Um, what I will say is that our office staff is small. There's eight people in my office in Littleton. And so when an EIS comes along to our office, it is such a big task that we hire outside scientists to help us, okay? So we are getting some outside help, but uh, everybody who's involved signs agreements and agrees that we're gonna work together and the core is gonna direct what they do and how they do it, okay? So the core uh, regulatory has complete control over this study. Okay, so let's get into the process now. And uh, I know these little words are small. Don't worry about reading them. Uh, I just put this up here to give you uh, 10 blocks to look at. And I made them colorful because I want to point something out here. Step one is yellow. Okay, and then we go down. Step two, three, four, five, six, those are blue. Step seven is yellow and so forth. And I made them yellow because those yellow ones are where the public gets involved. Okay, so I just want you to kind of remember that. Now, let me just remind you, before I start with step one, the reason the Corps of Engineers got involved in the first place is because of a trigger, okay, a placement of fill material into a river or a wetland. That is what triggered us, okay, to get involved in the first place, that placement of fill material. Fill material could be dirt, rock, whatever, but usually when someone's proposing an idea to, to you know, um, satisfy a water supply, there's gonna be some bit of fill somewhere, and that's what brings us in. Then we decide what level of review to do, and in, in these cases you know about, we decided to do an EIS. Okay, so step one. The very first thing we do, we receive this permit application, and we look at it, we decide to do an EIS, and immediately we turn to the public and we say, public, we want your feedback. We want to know what concerns you about this, okay? What, what do you think we should study hard, and, and how should we study it? Do you have ideas about how we should study uh, whatever you're concerned with? And so we present this idea to the public, and just because we're presenting it, does not necessarily mean that we agree with it, okay? It's just a, a way to get you all involved up front so we can understand what you're concerned about so we're studying the right things and um, covering the issues that are important. Okay, we ask what should we study, how should we study it, and what's most important. Okay, now I'm gonna dive right into all these steps at once and that's because what we do after that pu first public period is we go back to our offices and we put our heads down and we get to work, okay? And we review in a very specific sequence, okay? So that first thing we do is we question the need, okay? Question the need. Need is loaded. <laughs> um, Need with respect to water supply can get into the questions about population growth, okay, which I know you guys have been learning about in previous sessions, and, and that can get somewhat controversial because we're wondering, well, is that really going to happen, and how much, and how much water is really needed, and who needs it, and what are they using it for, okay, so the core really dives in and d delves into this, and we may spend up to a year just delving in and thinking about need, okay? But once need is settled on, and that's defined by the core, we get to decide that ultimate need. The next thing we do is we begin to list all the alternatives or solutions that might satisfy that need, okay? So I'll tell you this fact. Um, with the Northern Integrated Supply Project, 
the Corps of Engineers initially looked at over 200 sources of water and over 20 ideas for how to hold that water. Okay, because those are kind of two separate things, right? You got to think about where we're going to get water, but then how we're going to hold it so we can utilize it. Um, kind of a lot to think about there, but um, that's what we initially considered, and there was a huge list that we went through. Okay, so we look at these alternatives, and what happens is we start to narrow them down, or, or uh, my colleague likes to say that some get screened out. Okay, and the reason they get screened out is because perhaps they didn't meet the need, okay, that we had defined up front, or, or for some other reason, perhaps they're not logistically possible, perhaps they're extremely costly. Okay, think about it. For example, what if one of the alternatives was to go find water on the moon and bring it back? That's kind of too much, right? It gets screened out. <laughs> um, so, so stuff like that gets screened down, and then we narrow it down to about four, three to four possibilities, okay? And one that always comes down is whatever the proponent offered to us in the first place, okay? The proponent may, being Northern, or we call them the permit applicant. Northern um, Colorado Water Conservancy District is the applicant for NISP. Okay, so, so that one always makes it down. And then a couple others make it down from, from that weeding out that we did. And the last one that's always included is what if we do nothing? No action. What if we do nothing at all? What would be the impacts then, or what, what would happen then? Okay, so after that narrowing down, then we take those four and we do a very thorough impact analysis on those. Okay, and that's where it starts to get into um, looking very closely at the hydrology of the Poudre River, how it flows. You learned uh, about the hydrograph last time and how it has high flows, peak flows in the spring, and low flows in the, the fall and winter, and, and the whole ecological cycle that goes along with that. We dive into that very deeply. Okay, once we've analyzed impacts, then we do something, and this is something that NEPA requires of us, we consider mitigation for those things. Now, it, it occurs to me that thinking about mitigation sometimes implies that, oh, well, you must think that one's the best one, so you're already thinking about mitigation for it. You've already made up your mind. No, that is not the case. Uh, NEPA just requires us to consider mitigation, and so we do. We come up with some ideas for how we might mitigate for, for those alternatives. Okay, and then, when we're all done with that study, which takes years, <laughs> then we write it all up. We write the whole thing up, and uh, we create a, a draft EIS, and I actually brought, brought an example so you can see how big it is. This is a draft EIS for NISP, and it's heavy and it's thick. <laughs> and, um, you know, it doesn't read like Harry Potter, but, um, but, but it's interesting. This tells the story of all that we considered, okay? I would like to go back, though, to step three for a second, because I'm gonna show you a few of those alternatives that we initially considered uh, of that 200, because I think you might find this interesting. Okay, of those initial water sources we considered, I plucked a few out, and um, we considered ag water conservation, um, ag water purchases and options, um, preserving some ag while drying up others, um, this is my favorite one, cloud seeding. Folks, we even looked at cloud seeding because there's chemicals you can put into the atmosphere that'll cause it to rain, okay? And, and it's certainly a possibility and we certainly considered it and it, even a 20-page report was written on it. Um, and, and so that was just an idea we considered. Folks, we even considered, even as, as uh, silly as this might sound, if you cut down the forests, and it rains, all that water ends up flowing into the rivers and filling up the rivers instead of getting sucked up by the trees. So you have to admit, that is a way to get water, even though it's not so great for the forest, okay? 
So the, you know, these are things we seriously considered and then somehow they get kind of weeded out because they're, they turn out to be not practical or maybe they're even more environmentally damaging than, than what we're trying to do here. So um, I just want to, let, to emphasize that we did look at a lot of ideas, not necessarily water storage, okay? Okay, and then remember how I said we looked at water sources, but we also needed to look at ways to hold that water. So that's infrastructure. We looked at aquifers, okay, existing gravel ponds and existing reservoirs, perhaps enlarging them. And of course, we did look at new reservoirs as, as one of the options. And um, pumping facilities, um, increasing efficiencies, water treatment uh, plants, and so forth figuring out how we could solve this problem of that need for water in northern Colorado. Okay, so that was the example from step three alternative. So now I'm jumping into step seven, which is yellow. And so that's um, public involvement again. Okay, so what the Corps of Engineers does is hold public hearings. And we have this draft EIS that we hoped you read. <laughs> and when we have these public hearings, what we're asking of you is, please read this and let us know what you think. Let us know how we did. We want to know how we did. Did we do the science that you expected? Do you want us to do more? Did we miss something? Do you have questions about what we did? That's what the public hearing is for in step seven, and the public is very welcome and very, um, you know, welcome to come and give us, give us the comments so we can understand. Remember, this is a draft document, okay? So it doesn't mean it's the end deal, okay? This can change. It's just a draft, and we want your thoughts on it. So what we do is we listen to your comments and we go back to our desks again and we start working on whatever we you know, may have missed or do revisions or whatever's necessary. Okay, so step nine and 10. So finally, at some point, we develop what's called a final EIS, okay? And a final EIS gets released and then at that point, Okay, even the EIS doesn't actually make a recommendation at all on what project ought to be built. It's just a document that discloses the information that we studied, makes no recommendation at all. And so then with step 10, all appropriate or applicable agencies that have some sort of license or permit to issue, those people will make decisions and hopefully they'll make their decisions based on the EIS so that they can make an informed decision, okay? Okay, so now I'm gonna dive real quick into the status of some of these water supply EISs. We're gonna talk about um, the CORE's EIS for NISP, Northern Integrated Supply Project. That is, um, Northern's proposal is Glade and Gailton Reservoirs. And the second EIS that we're working on is Halligan Seaman, and those are reservoir expansions. And I wanted you to notice something. I'm gonna keep reminding you of this. Notice that the EIS is written and developed by the core, not the proponent. I wanna make that very clear. Uh, the proponent is certainly involved in our process. Um, we talk with them a lot, and we get you know, feedback from them. They submitted the permit application, so they're giving us details about what they've proposed. But we control this process. We write the document. The document belongs to the Corps of Engineers, okay? And we did that study in an independent manner. So with NISP, okay? NISP, that first public meeting where we asked what should we study, that happened in 2004. Step one happened in 2004. And then in 2008, we released the draft EIS and we asked the public what to study. Or no, we asked the public what you thought of what we studied, okay? And so what's happening with NISP right now is after that public comment period, we got a lot, a lot, a lot of feedback. And so we're going back and we're actually doing some further study 
And we're even doing something that, that's somewhat unusual. We're doing what's called a supplemental e draft EIS. That means we're going back and we're really diving into some, some stuff that we need to study again. And then we'll, we'll do another round of public hearings again on a, on a second draft. So if you do the math here, so far we've been working on this for seven years. Okay, with the Halligan Seaman EIS, we started a little bit later than this, started in 2006, and we have not yet released a draft EIS. So we are still in the impact analysis stage for Halligan Seaman. And so, so far we've been reviewing this uh, for six years. Okay, so just a quick review. Here's our 10 steps. And Halligan Seaman is in the impact analysis phase. And NIST is past the draft EIS, but we're going back and studying some more. So we still have a little ways to go. Okay, so here's some controversial is issues, as I understand, that, that maybe get addressed in the EIS or maybe you're just out there floating around right now. Um, of course, population growth is a controversial issue, and is it real? Is it, is it exaggerated? Um, you know, how does that affect w that water that we need or don't need? Um, do new reservoirs encourage growth? Um, that's a good question. Um, the concern about Poudre River flows and what new rev reservoirs might do to the Poudre River or not do. And the question, if we build something, what will happen? And if we build nothing, what will happen? OK, so here's some key points I want you to remember. Remember, an EIS just discloses the information that we studied. It actually does not make a recommendation about what should be built. It's just looking at the science. And remember that we, we consider things in a very specific sequence. We first question the need then list a whole bunch of solutions, narrow it down, analyze the impacts, consider mitigation for those impacts, and then disclose that information to you without necessarily recommending any particular solution. Okay, and then here's some other key points to remember. Preparing an EIS does not guarantee a permit will be issued. You know, we can spend years studying this, and then it can turn out that uh, no permit gets issued or nothing is done. That, that is a possibility. So I just want to emphasize that doing an EIS doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen. Um, typically, the actual decision making happens after the final EIS, and that's still quite a ways away. It, it could be as much as a, as a year away from after the final EIS, so there's still a lot of time. Okay, uh, some other permits uh, need to be issued besides the Corps of Engineers permit. We, we do have a permit that we issue, but there's some other agencies involved. Um, and the EIS's purpose is to help those, those agencies make decisions. So let's take a look at who else is involved with NISP, for example. Okay, so we have the Corps permit. And interestingly, the Bureau of Reclamation is also involved. They have a water services contract, so they'll be depending on our EIS to help make the, their decision. Also, the state of Colorado has a water quality certificate, so they, they're heavily involved. And then even Larimer County has some land use uh, laws in which they'll have some approvals to make. So it's more than just the core. And in addition, uh, some other agencies are involved just because the Corps needs to have concurrence before we can issue our permit. So that means the Fish and Wildlife Service gets involved with respect to endangered species. The EPA is involved with respect to air and water and all, all sorts of issues. Even the Colorado Historical Society is involved with respect to cultural resources, Native American resources perhaps in the case of NISP. And interestingly, the Colorado Department of Transportation is involved because the proponent's idea would involve moving over a highway. Okay, and so they have to have input there. Okay, so here's some interesting facts. Um, the Corps is operating under some very specific rules, 
And sometimes the public might not quite understand that. They're thinking, now why do you go about doing it that way? Why do you consider it that way? Well, because that's what the rules say. I will add that the core regulatory program does not have the authority to tell local communities to slow growth or stop watering lawns. If it were that simple, boy, I guess that would be a little better. <laughs> Uh, core regulatory does not set the price of water. Our job is only to disclose what that price might be and let decision makers or the public decide if that's worrisome or, or something that hinders decision making. With respect to water rights, okay, core regulatory does not interfere with water rights. However, I will say that we do study environmental impacts of river exchanges, okay? If someone takes water out up here, and then they make a deal with the downstream guy to release some over there, then the spot in between dries up. And that's an impact to the river. And so that's our job to consider that, okay? So that's where we would consider how a water right or an exchange might affect the environment, affect the river. Now, uh, the last point I want to make here is core regulatory um, also doesn't have the authority to do any kind of regional planning for an area, even though I, I realize that kind of makes sense to do that. Since we're tasked only to review permit applications that come into us, we're just reactionary that way, okay? And that placement of fill triggers us to do that you know, environmental review, and that's all we can do. We can't make applicants work together. Okay, it's up to them when they decide to submit their permit application. Okay, so Mary Lou wanted me to touch on something that is unique to both NISP and Halligan Seaman, and it goes against what I just said about regional planning. Um, the Corps of Engineers decided, after the NISP draft EIS was released, that we had some issues with how we were modeling the Poudre River and how we were doing that for NISP and how we were doing that for Halligan Seaman, keeping in mind that it was all within the Poudre Basin, okay? And it only made sense to do it consistently, okay? But that's controversial in our program because like I just told you, we're not allowed to make applicants work together. But in this case, we thought it was imperative. We thought it was important to the public and to the environment. So we put our hands on our hips and we said, we're going to do this, applicants, and you're going to agree to it. <laughs> and so as a result, we ended up um, creating this hydroanalysis that's consistent within the basin, and we call it the common technical platform. And I know there's a lot of words up here, and I didn't mean to read them all. I'd hope that uh, later, if you go read these slides, you can read it again to understand it. OK, and then the last point I want to leave with you here is core regulatory is not engineering anything. We're just a team of independent biologists, ecologists, hydrologists, archaeologists, economists even. The economists are looking at need. OK, that's where, that's where their specialty is. And all we're really doing here is we're just taking a hard look at these issues that you guys are so concerned about and that you've been talking about in these forums. And we're putting that into this document and then we're providing it for you to read and to see and make your own decision from it. And some last thoughts. You know, Mary Lou had me uh, look through those comments that folks made back on February 3rd. And this one caught my eye. He said, or maybe it was a woman, they said, don't get me started, my head is about to explode already. And I thought, you know what, sometimes we feel that way at the core, and that is why we wear these hats. <laughs> to keep our heads from exploding and protecting you all, or maybe we're protecting ourselves from you, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> but I just thought I'd add that, and um, you know, we're, we're, we sympathize with that. It, it's stressful for us, too, going through this process. And um, just wanted to have a little laugh there. So thank you very much for your attention. And um, there's more information at our website. OK. <laughs> Thanks.
Thank you, Rena. That clarified a lot of things for me. I think even those of us who work in water a lot just have a hard time understanding um, all, all the pieces about this. Rena, I would like for you to come back up because we do have about five minutes for questions of Rena specific to the permitting process. Uh, as you can tell, we, we haven't planned time in this series to go into great detail on either of these projects, but we, we have time for questions about the permitting process. So <clears throat> if you have a question, will you come to the mic, please? And, and um, that gentleman started first, but this one got to the mic first. So, okay, you go ahead. Rita, thank you. Thank you for the information. It was very helpful, and you cleared up some misconception I, I have, but I have a question. Okay. I understand that the Corps is not allowed to make applicants work together. But here's a hypothetical question. If, for instance, these two applicants decided to work together mm -hmm. and decided to prepare a suite of mitigation strategies that might you know, offer more options and better protect the hydrology of the river, would the Corps look positively on that? Yes. Yes. Yes, if the applicants are willing to do that, if the applicants are willing to do that, then certainly we would be completely open to that. Yes, thank you for asking. Okay, and this gentleman here. Study. What determines on whether or not you actually issue the permit? You know, first it's important to remember that the Corps permit is not the only one. So in order for, in theory, for the project to actually be built, all five of those agencies would have to issue as opposed to deny, okay? So that's one thing to think about. And then the next thing, the Corps, uh, decision on making a permit has to do with what we call the least environmentally damaging alternative that's the most practicable. So what we're looking at from our point of view and what we're charged with with Clean Water Act and protection of rivers and wetlands, we're looking at those impacts to wetlands and also the impact of sucking the water from somewhere else or sucking it out of the river. We call that an indirect impact. So we look at those impacts and we decide which is the least environmentally damaging, but still practicable to do. And then that ends up being our decision. And in some cases we may deny, okay? And we certainly haven't made a decision yet. Thank you. Okay, this gentleman. Uh, you mentioned that in the first proposal there were a large number of inputs and you were going back and doing a, a lot more study. Are you considering reissuing it at step seven and asking for more public input. Like re-releasing re another draft EIS. Yeah, right. Yes, yes we will. Okay. And that is supposed to come at the end of this year. The end of 2011 is when it's scheduled to come out again and we'll have a public hearing again. And we're excited to see what you think of what we've released. We will. We will. We definitely will. Okay. Rena, thank you so much. Or Gina, do you want to ask the last question? We have time for one more. Of the uh, very large document you showed us <laughs> and the fact that there will be another supplemental, uh, as part of the public, we would request a 120-day comment and review period because that's an awful lot to cover. So that's a comment, I guess. Thank you. Thank you for that, and we'll consider it. Okay, thank you, Rena. And now we're going to go to our third review of uh, ways that we might look at for meeting uh, demand for water, and that's urban water conservation. And we have two speakers tonight on that topic. First of all, I've invited Lori Diodney, who is the water conservation specialist for the city of Fort Collins, to tell you about what Fort Collins water conservation plan is like. And then I've asked uh, John Monson from Greeley, the city of, of uh, Greeley's water and sewer department, to talk to us. And the reason I chose John is because after Lori gives you the nuts and bolts of the water conservation plan, 
there were two reasons I asked John. One is because I wanted to, to use the opportunity to bring someone from our sister community that we share the river with. But the second reason is that during the years that I have been talking to John at water meetings, I always find that he likes to look at the questions behind the policies. He's not just looking at a policy, but he likes to question why are we doing things a certain way. And so what I wanted him to do after Laurie speaks is to give us some of the background of some of the questions that water policy makers look at when they're trying to make decisions about what policies, in this case urban water conservation policies, to enact. So he's going to give us some pro and cons of different ways of looking at some of these issues. So a bit of a ph philosophical approach. But with that, I will bring up uh, Lori's and ask her to come forward. Well, it's great to be here tonight to talk to you about water conservation. So I was just going to give you an overview real quick about what I'll be talking about. First, just um, the big picture of water conservation planning and some of the state's requirements. And then we'll look at Fort Collins and the history of our water conservation program and some of the policies that drive it, our water use characteristics, and then um, a brief overview of our conservation programs. So a water conservation plan basically provides, provides a roadmap for ways that we can implement water conservation programs and also look at our water supply. It offers, offers the opportunity to look at what is our supply? What is our demand? Demand for the future? So where do we want to set our water conservation goals? And then looking at a whole uh, slew of measures and programs that we might implement and then make decisions about what would be best for our situation. So in Colorado, the Water Conservation Act of 2004 requires any water provider that supplies 2,000 acre feet of water annually or more to have an approved water conservation plan. And if you're interested in getting any kind of water, state water loans, you have to have an approved plan on file with the state. So and there are nine planning steps. Actually, the state has a whole document um, of guidance of how to complete in the requirements and how to meet them for your water conservation plan. So of course, you have to look at your whole water system. You need to see, look at what is your water use currently and what do you project into the future? And what are your proposed facilities? And then you want to um, set some water conservation goals. And then you get a whole long list of all the different options of water conservation programs to look at. And then you'll evaluate those with your own criteria select what you'd like to put in place for your utility, then modify your forecast for the goals that you set, and then come up with a plan of how are you going to implement the program. And then it's an ever-evolving document. You're always monitoring it, tracking your um, savings, and then revising the plan whenever you need to. So in Fort Collins, we've had a staffed water conservation program since 1977. And we have, a, we have two policies that guide us in our water conservation. There's a water supply and demand management policy that council adopted in 2003. It set a goal of 185 gallons per person per day. And I, most of you probably know, but the gallons per person per day takes into account all the commercial, residential, multifamily water use. So it's the total of our annual water use divided by our, what we call our service area population, and then of course divided by 365 per day, days per year. And that policy, and the 185 was set back in 2003, and we'll talk a little more about our water use and what it looks like now. But that policy is in the process of being updated. And some of you here are perhaps involved. We have a consultant working with staff and a whole large group of stakeholders that are involved in trying to set parameters, review what we have, see what changes need to be made. And in 2010, the state did adopt our water conservation plan. And in that plan, we set a goal of 140 gallons per person per day. So just to put it in perspective, 
Between 2004 and 2010, the average water use was 153 gallons per person per day. So as far as our water conservation plan, I'll be telling you about the measures that some we've had in place for quite a while and we've been adding new measures all the time since we um, got a new budget for the program. But we track our water demand on a monthly and annual basis. We also try and evaluate how are our programs impacting our water use and how overall are we making progress to our goal. Every year we prepare an annual report that goes to City Council. It's on our website and we make it available to anybody who'd like to see it. But we'll also be revising our plan every five years. Um, the state requires every seven years to have a new plan submitted. But we decided we wanted to shorten that time frame and we would revise ours every five years. So now we're just going to look a little bit about our water use. If you look at the bar on the left, we call that our historic water use. Basically from 1985 to 1992, the average use was at 232 gallons per person per day. That was a pretty impressive number. And then at the 1993 to 2001, we call the pre-drought water use, and it was down to 196 per gallons, gallons per person per day. And actually, those are the numbers that were used when we were putting together the 2003 water supply and demand management policy. So that's how it came to be 185 gallons per person per day goal. Well then, as I said, the, what we call the post-drought water use at 2004 to 2010 was 100, is 153. So, and we have our water conservation goal here at 140 gallons per person per day. And this is a look, a little closer look at that 2004 to 2010 water use. It shows the red is the outdoor use and the blue is the indoor use. It's for commercial and then residential, both single family and duplex and then multifamily. But as you can see, outdoor use is only 35% of the total water use. I know most people think it's a lot larger than that, but surprisingly it's um, a smaller piece of the whole water use than normally we think. So this one just takes the pre-drought 1998 to 2001 and the post-drought 2004-2010 uh, and compared how the water use has been affected. But probably the most visible thing is that the outdoor water use for residential was drastically reduced in that time period. So I know we used to say um, at least half of the water use goes for outdoor for residential, but today it's less than that. And this looks at, like, at the average Poudre River Basin supplies. So it includes both the native flows, the Colorado Big Thompson and Windy Gap imports, and the Trans, Trans Mountain diversions. And over here, the blue you'll see is the treated water that the city of Collins uses, and then there's a little teeny line there for the raw water use. So I know we always think um, Fort Collins is a has a huge impact on the Poudre River supplies, but we're really about 7% of that use. So I just was going to quickly go over some of the water conservation programs we have in place. This is some of our marketing materials. You might have seen them around town on some of the bus benches or our bill inserts. And we're big proponents of Xeriscape. We really like to have people have landscapes that fit into our regional character you know, ones that will thrive and grow well here, even when we do have times perhaps of less water. We have a Xeriscape demonstration garden. It's over in front of City Hall on the Port Avenue. We do tours there, but it's really open anytime for anyone to visit. We have lots of Xeriscape classes we put on for the public. We have an all-day landscape workshop that's very popular every year. And right now we're just signing up people for our annual Xeriscape design clinics where folks can sit down with a landscape designer for an hour and a half and work on a plan for a portion of their yard. Those have been very popular. 
And this will be our 12th year of doing our sprinkler audit program. We go out to homes and homeowners associations and do an analysis of their sprinkler systems, their look at their controllers, how they're watering, their scheduling, any kind of problems, make recommendations to them. And then they can take those and um, make changes to their system and hopefully um, we're helping them to water more efficiently. So after our water conservation plan was put in place, we, some of the new programs were the uh, toilet rebate program. We give a uh, rebate for a water sense toilet purchase and also for recycling the old toilet. Another one we put in place last year was a uh, sprinkler equipment rebates. So again, trying to make sprinkler systems more efficient with weather-based controllers and rain sensors. They're a little device that you put up on your eave and it shuts off your controller so you aren't watering while it's raining. And also, the, these are a new product, uh, multi-jet rotating nozzles. Anyway, they just go on the top of your little spray heads and they're high efficiency. So for quite a while, we've had some of these other rebates and incentives for clothes washers and dishwashers and our zero interest loans. Those are for water conservation improvements. For many years, we've had a very active school program. Well, we totally believe that educating our children is um, educating our future leaders and for them to understand the importance of water, water quality and water conservation really lasts a lifetime. And commercial outreach. We have a business environmental program series where we put on programs for various sectors of the business community. We do audits out in the um, business facilities. Usually those are in conjunction with our climate wise program and our energy assessments. And then this year, a couple of the new programs we'll be putting in place are commercial incentives. So that'll be some rebates for various water conservation items. And also we'd like to distribute the pre-rinsed spray nozzles to restaurants. There's some nice high efficiency ones that work really well. And they're the sprayer that the restaurants use to clean the dishes before they put them in the dishwasher. But they are, are very low cost, but high water savings. We also have some regulatory measures that we enforce. One is a wasting water ordinance. So your sprinkler water is not supposed to run off your property and down the street. We also have a water supply shortage response plan. Luckily, we haven't had to enforce that lately, but it does set for various levels of water shortage, what kind of restrictions or measures we plan to put in place to meet that. We have a water conservation standards for landscaping and irrigation. Actually, we revised those in 2009, so there's a few stricter requirements now. We review, um, landscape plans, irrigation plans, and do site visits. And this pertains just to commercial HOAs, anybody that has to go through the whole landscape review process. And with that, I can take questions. We have time for one Okay. <laughs> so it looks like we have someone here who has a question. Uh, maybe not so much a question, but a suggestion. Okay. Um, that is that uh, grass, which we have so much of in the community, uh, in the summer during the hot months goes through a natural period of dormancy. And so perhaps to educate our community about using dormancy as a way to conserve water because, uh, it, for instance, in the summer of 2009, I did an experiment on my own lawn, didn't water at all. And of course, some neighbors were very concerned when we had some hot weeks that I had killed everything. But mm. as soon as the weather cooled and I resumed watering, of course, the grass did well, rebounded well. So that might be a topic for the community to look at too. Yeah, thank you. And that is something we talked about, I know, during the drought, but probably not as much since then. So I have a question about your goal. It seems to me like there are sort of two types of water usage. The water that's used that doesn't go back to the system, such as what goes to yards, and the water that gets returned to the system, such as what goes down the drain when you take a shower. Um, do you have separate goals for those and, and roll them up into that 140, or how do you look at that? 
Well, we really just came up with one goal. So we, um, I mean, we looked at indoor use and outdoor use. And we, I know when we were doing our planning, we looked at different types of landscapes, what do we want our community to look, look like. And, but we did wrap it all up into one goal. Are you going to consider breaking that down in the future? Because it does have a big impact on the downstream flow. Well, we certainly would consider that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That leads us really to our next speaker because we're going to be looking at some of the issues behind our policies. Um, very good question about about the return flow and how what that has to do with the policy that we come up with. So thanks, Lori. And now I'm going to turn it over to John to talk about some of those issues. Mary Lou asked me to speak, she said, because she thought I might be able to give you a somewhat balanced view of uh, urban water conservation. I would appreciate it if you give me some feedback on the end to see whether I've succeeded or not. Looking right at you, Gary. Um, I notice in my presentation that I'm pretty hard on Zurich um, because the numbers aren't working out for me. And I, because they're somewhat preliminary, I would uh, really like some feedback on that as well. I've uh, talked to water, uh, Western Resource Advocates about the numbers on Zurich, and I'm going to ask them for some um, verification of them. Because the uh, Zurich, as beautiful as it is, and is well suited as it is to this climate is quite expensive when you look at the numbers. And I would uh, like us as a group to make sure we know what we're talking about there. Uh, I am not a conservation expert. You just heard from one. Uh, what I am is a water manager who is trying to provide a water supply for my citizens. And one of those supplies is water conservation. Uh, Greeley has got an extremely strong uh, water conservation ethic and a water conservation program. When, uh, back in the drought of 2002, uh, the Denver Post called up and they said, um, how long has Greeley had water restrictions? And I had to think a bit and I said, well, a little over 100 years. <laughs> it's 105 now, by the way. Um, we have been on an even odd watering restriction for over 105 years since we started this program in uh, 1906. So we take water conservation very seriously because it is such an important thing. Um, and I'd like to share some of the issues with you that uh, we take into account. A couple of things you ought to refer to is the SWAZI, Statewide Water Supply Initiative 2010. This is their water conservation strategies. Extremely detailed and a lot of effort has gone into this and I will quote from this on occasion. The other one that has just come out, which is quite interesting, is Filling the Gap by Western Resource Advocates, uh, Trout Unlimited and Colorado Environmental Coalition. Some very good stuff in here. I, I would recommend both of those to you because uh, water conservation is such an, an, a complex issue and I'd like to share some of that complexity with you. Both of these documents, one created by the state roundtable process and the other by a uh, consortium of environmental groups, both of them put water conservation as one of three or four major ways we're going to get water supplies in the future. Both of them identify existing projects and processes, IPPs. Both of them talk about ag to urban transfer of water. Both of them talk about water conservation, um, where the part ways is the Swazi report talks about new supplies, which are basically transbasin coming over from the West Slope. And the um, Filling the gap project or suggests that we can meet our water demands without transbasin. But uh, both of them, I might point out, do talk about water conservation as a major, major water supply. Now, as a definition of water conservation, well, I'd like to talk to you about a couple of concepts. Uh, water is 
for beneficial use. I would like to make sure everybody agrees with that. So thanks to Denver Water, we've got this phrase, use only what you need. Why? So that you can have water for other uses. I mean, it's simple, but get, I'm getting these concepts straight in my head so that I can make some decisions later with regard to my water supplies. This one, the cost is ultimately borne by the consumer is something we really need to make sure we understand because all the water rebate programs, as an example, are costs both to the utility and to the consumer. They share in those costs, so we need to combine those costs whenever we look at the true cost of water. But for a definition of conservation, I like this one from the Filling the Gap program uh, document permanent reduction of per capita water uh, resulting from long-term implementation of water saving practices and technologies. I underline the water savings because it comes back to what conservation is for. You want to conserve water so that you've got it for something else, some other beneficial use. Sounds simple, but it gets pretty strange at some times. Now, I would... Um, I'm going to ramble here, I'm afraid, a little bit, uh, but I'm just giving you one water manager's understanding of these issues that I've come to, come to um, wrestle with for the last several years. Um, this use only what you need is critical because we want to save water for something else, and that something else could be municipal, industrial, recreation, environmental, something else. Keep that in mind and the cost is being paid for by the consumer. Now, I'm going to use a metaphor, and any time you use metaphors, you really have to be careful. Maybe it's an analogy, I'm not quite sure. Maybe I've got some professors here that could tell me the difference, but I'm gonna talk about showers, taking showers. And I would like you to think about that as a metaphor, an analogy to uh, land irrigation and water use in general by itself. Now, um, as an example, some people would say that they call this in the military a Hollywood shower, very lavish, just run water everywhere, okay? Then you've got the efficient shower. You go to either our water conservation people or Fort Collins and you get a shower restrictor and you've got five gallons a minute, and you put your little timer on there, and you take an efficient shower, okay? That's beneficial use. The lavish is waste, okay? And I want to make the distinction, I make it in my own mind, between lavish use of water and efficient use of water. Now, you could get even more efficient. You could do a military shower. That's when you, rinse, you get wet, turn the water off. You soap up, turn the water back on, and rinse off. That saves water, seriously. So we can do waste in water, efficient use of water, or military shower, or you might even do no shower. Okay? I think we all will agree no shower saves the most water. It's not a beneficial use of water, though. So think about that concept. So given that we've got uses of water, I think you can translate this kind of in your mind to irrigation. You could have bluegrass lawn out the wazoo being flood irrigated, coming over the curb, running down the street. I've seen it. I won't tell you which city it was in, but I've seen it. You could have very efficient bluegrass lawn with the rain sensors, with the uh, no overspray. You could go to Zurich. I'm not going to call it military landscaping, but you could go to Zurich and use less water, or you could go to no water at all. Now, this is how the Australians got to 60 gallons per capita per day. You saw Fort Collins' admirable goal of 140. Australians are doing 60, indoor use only. Everything else outside 
fends for itself, right? If we tried that, um, if we tried that, this is what we have. This is our natural environment in Colorado. This is what the area looks like before the water comes. This is what we want. We want to change our environment by beneficial use of water. So keep that in mind, that you only have so much water, you only have so much money, you only have so much time, and the balancing of all this is where it really gets tricky. One of the things that the, the ag people have uh, really got stuck in my mind is that the United States, on the average, spends like 7% of their income on food. Compare that to Germany or Japan that are spending 20 or 25% of their income on food. What does that mean to me? The difference between spending 20% of your income and seven means you've got 13% of your income that you can put someplace else. Same with conservation. You got water conservation, you conserve water to someplace another from 160 gallons per capita per day down to 140, you've got that extra to do something else with. That's kind of the way I'm thinking of this stuff. 140. Can we still have this at 140? Or do you want something else? That's the kind of the balance that we're all struggling with here, I think. So putting that water, that saved water, to a different beneficial use is what we're trying to get to. The other concept I really want you to grasp, because it was revolutionary to me when I finally got it, is that the money all comes from the same customer. Now that seems so simple, but we had a, a boil water order several years ago. Okay? It was a scare, nothing in, in the water, just was over cautious. And so people started buying bottled water because they didn't want to boil it. So someone comes up to me and they say, you're responsible, buy my bottled water for me. Okay, I'm a public utility. No stockholders except the citizens. Here, give me the money for the bottled water. I'll buy it, I'll give it to you. It comes out of your own pocket. It doesn't come from any place else. It comes from your pocket. So when we talk about um, water conservation programs, toilet rebates as a good example. Toilet rebates are a good example because to, to replace a toilet costs money. Fort Collins offers 35, uh, I forget what we're offering, 50 maybe, something like that in Greeley. Um, but to get a plumber to buy the toilet at Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever, get a plumber to put it in, you're talking about, what, $250 maybe? That's the cost of water conservation, 250 not 35 it isn't the cost of the rebate program, it's the cost to the customer because that same money is coming out of that same pocket. So once you recognize that, things get a little different. So just to make sure we're only so much money in time, 7% other things, I'm behind in my slides, aren't I? So if we're gonna save 30% of our water, um, Western Resource Advocates suggest that we follow the Swazi maximum water savings uh, of 34%, but, you know, someplace in there. What are you going to spend that on? And the money comes out of the same pocket. Okay, I've done all that. Why do we conserve water? It's the right thing to do. Primary. It's, it's it literally... Most of us believe it's a moral responsibility not to waste water in a semi-arid environment. As I point out here, I use Atlanta as an example because my father lives in Atlanta. And they get 55 inches of rain a year. We get 12, 14. It takes 34 to 36 inches of moisture to grow something out here. So we have to add two feet of water to grow anything out here. 
The other reason, from a manager's point of view, is to stretch your supply. If you can get more and more people to use the same amount of water by each one of them using a little less, you don't have to go out to the market and buy new water. You don't have to develop a new program. Stretching supply is in our own financial best interest. Stretching infrastructure. The difference in water demand between the winter and the summer is threefold, which means in the summer, the pipes have to be three times as big as they do in the winter. The treatment plant, the filter plant, has to be three times as big as it does in the winter. So you have to build something three times as big in order to get the irrigation you need. It's a beneficial use, but if we can do water conservation to reduce that demand, we're saving our own selves money. These are the sort of things that a manager like myself look at. But difficulties, there's always difficulties. The willingness to pay for something is how we allocate the scarce resource. And the problem is, when you save that water, whose water is it? And how do you value those other, those other uses? I listed four just general you know, um, environmental recreation you know, crops. Each one of those has a value to us as a society. How do we value that and how do we get the people who are, are paying to pay for that and the people who are benefiting from it to pay for that and so forth? These are some of the issues that I'm wrestling with. I love this definition of um, externality. It's a word I came up with just the other day. I've heard it, but I never looked it up. It's a cost or benefit that is not transmitted through prices. A damaged river, a dewatered river, doesn't come to you as a price, but it certainly is a, a, a cost. And the cost is incurred by a party who did not agree to the action. This is a really nice definition of externality, uh, and it applies to our water system quite, quite readily. So I'd like to get on to costs a little bit here. Well, let me detour into gallons per capita per day. I always like to point out that Western Resource Advocates uh, also states that comparing gallons per capita per day from one city to another city is a bad idea. Okay? I like to say that because Greeley is pretty high, and I don't want anybody to think that we're not doing well, good job. But it's true, um, both that we're high and that um, it's not a good idea. It is a good idea to use it, gallons per capita per day, to track your own progress. And as I point out here, Greeley, like Fort Collins, like a lot of cities, pre-drought, post-drought has dropped 20% in our water demand. Uh, the numbers that you just saw, I think Fort Collins was 22% or something like that. Different areas we're looking at, but everybody around the Front Range has taken this very seriously, and we've dropped about 20%. But if you try to compare Greeley to Fort Collins or to Loveland or to Denver or to Colorado Springs, for instance, you come up with some very different numbers. These are some of the reasons in, when you do comparison of gallons per capita per day. Microclimate literally how hot and dry it is, evapotranspiration, which drives the um, water demand, is different. And these are some numbers we just pulled up for the northern front range. And it's about 10 gallons per minute, or 10 gallons per capita per day um, can be shown between Berthoud and Fort Collins and Greeley in that triangle there. There's that much difference in the microclimate. So be careful when you compare things. Lot size, a bigger lot is going to use more water for that one person living on it. Now, some people will argue that person shouldn't have that much lot. Have everybody have a, sm a smaller lot, higher density, prevent urban sprawl. Good problem to wrestle with. 
Landscaping preferences. One of the reasons Colorado Springs has a lower gallons per capita per day is that they have got um, mountain or they've got subdivisions on the side of the hills, no irrigation up there at all, right? Should we all look like that? Kind of a question of values there. These are some of the things I'm wrestling with in, in my business. And when you do gallons per capita per day, what are you talking about? Are you talking about the gross number? Are you talking about residential gallons per capita per day? Did you include the university? Did you include the beer manufacturer in your, in your um, cal calculation there? Did you include non-potable? And we generally don't. We're generally talking about drinking water. So if a city has a very good non-potable system using ditch water, their gallons per capita a day looks really good, but they're using a lot of water. So be really careful when you uh, work on all these numbers one way or another. So I've talked microclimate, I've talked almost out of time here I've talked, but let me talk about where the water is and where we can save it. Um, 45 gallons per person indoor use, this is kind of an EPA standard, 60 is somewhere usual, some people use it out there. This is a, you've seen this chart many times, um, where our water goes on an indoor use. Um, obviously, you look at this and say, wow, if we can go low flow toilets, we're in good shape. I mean, we can grab quite a bit of that 27% up there in toilets. Showers, military showers, anybody? There's 18% up for grabs. Leaks, oh my goodness, 15% of my water is going to leaks? That's indoor. Uh, Greeley, by the way, probably like Fort Collins, has a, a leak detection program for our pipelines in the street. We've got a, a microphone that we put on a, a, a valve and another microphone that we put on a, um, a fire hydrant, and the microphones listen for the hiss of a leak. And that hiss has a waveform, and the computer matches the waveforms up so that you can tell exactly how far from the microphone the leak is. You go dig it up. We measured 18 miles of pipe last year. We found one leak. Not a, not a very, it was a dribble too, by the way. Um, so leak detection is an important part of a water conservation program, but it might not lead, yield too much bang for your buck. But leaks in the house, maybe we should hire plumbers to go in and fix everybody's leaks. Um, we had a, uh, a apartment owner, operator, who went in when 2002 came around, he went in and he fixed everything that leaked, dripped, squeaked, everything. Is Ruth here? Okay. I always forget this number. It was like 60% drop in his uh, water use. Amazing job, right? We spent $25,000 going into the JBS meatpacking plant to look at their leaks, and they have cut their demand 15%. So leaks are a very big deal in this thing. But let's talk toilets just a moment. Um, we've done about, or, or about half the toilets in Greeley are still high flush, okay? Still five gallons uh, flush. If we went in and repaired or replaced every one of those toilets, it cost us about $2 million, a um, little over $2 million. It's, it's about four years of my water conservation budget. So, but I could do that, right? And I would, gain, I would get that 27 down to 9%. You know, really good idea. That would save me a total of 430 acre feet. Now, I know not many of you understand the numbers we work in. I need 10,000. All the toilets in Greeley will gain me 400, about 4%. It's, the, it's a step. So we're going to do it. We're going to get there, but just toilets, just low flow showers, just leaks, indoor use, every little bit helps but it's not going, it, it's why both Swazi and 
filling the gap, talk about conservation as one part of the, the program. So that's where we're working, I've just explained to you. And by the way, that is the cheapest water I can get. If I went in and spent $200, $250 for every toilet in, in Greeley that hasn't been changed already, that's the cheapest water. That's about 5,700 an acre foot. Ag water, maybe seven, okay? Reservoirs, 12 to $20,000 an acre foot. Keep those numbers in mind because Zurich turns out to be much more expensive than I had imagined. And this is where I need some help from the environmental community to check my numbers because this is kind of shocking stuff to me. There's that toilet. This is a residential, not total city. Those are where the thing, we need, we pointed out we need 24 inches of water to grow things and water demand triples in the summer. So let's go for the bang for the buck. Let's go for the outdoor water use. 24 inches for every acre of subdivision that I could turn into Zurich, I could probably cut that in half. There are two studies done. Uh, one is called the Yardex. Uh, Fort Collins, I believe, was part of that. Um, Greeley, Colorado Springs, several. They saw that Zurich could probably cut maybe 50% the 50% uh, of your water demand outside. The Swazi report looks at maybe 30%. So let's look at 30 to 50% range. For every acre of land that we do that, we save an acre foot. Everybody follow me on that? So we're gonna save half of that two feet. We got an acre foot for every acre. What does it cost to do Zurich? The rebate is a dollar a square foot. The cost to do Zurich is someplace between three and five dollars a square foot. Remember, it all comes out of the same pocket. It all comes out of the, the customer's pocket. So if the customer is paying four dollars a square foot to save one acre foot, Zurich turns out to be extremely expensive. Four or five times the cost of a reservoir. Should we do it? Where should we put our money? This is the challenge that we as a community have got, and I as a water manager have got as well. Um, maybe we should do bluegrass. This gentleman who talked about the drought buffering of bluegrass, right on. I mean, we can let that stuff go dormant, drop our outdoor water demand very quickly. Um, maybe. So those are some of the issues that I am wrestling with. Um, and who makes this determination? You know, is it the water provider? Should the water provider tell you how much water you should put on your grass? How much grass you should have? Why? So that we can save that water to do something else? Probably. But where that balance is, everybody agrees we don't want the Hollywood lavish shower. That's wasteful. But the balance, and every, most everybody agrees, not everybody, but most everybody agrees we want some vegetation in, in here. But that balance, where is it? Between the efficient shower and the military shower. That's what we're struggling with. And um, I hope I've given you some concept of the complexity that I see in this business. And the, uh, what I'd leave you with is that Conservation is a good thing. We need to do as much as we can. Um, conserved water is sometimes the cheapest water I can get, and sometimes it's the most expensive, I think. I really need some feedback on that, guys. And we need to do it all. Again, uh, the various water people in the state have come up with these projects. Milton Seaman Reservoir, Halligan Seaman is one of them. Um, NISP is another, uh, Windy Gap Firming is another, agricultural conversions, water conservation, major part of this, and then these new projects, Trans Basin. We need it all in order to provide for the, for the future. Thanks.
Okay, now comes the challenge. It's five after seven. And if you've been to these other sessions, you know that we have so much to cover in such a short amount of time. We're going to eat into our last part by having uh, a good five minutes for questions at this point. I would like to point out that the feedback that John is asking for, we don't really have time for that feedback to come tonight because that's not really um, a question or an answer. But let's do, if you have feedback for John, uh, go on the City of Greeley website and get his email address and uh, please give him that, that feedback. But now we're ready for some questions for John. So if you'll come up to the mics, um, I'd appreciate it. Wow, that was a good talk. <laughs> <laughs> if we don't have questions, we'll have this one and then we will uh, we'll go on to our next part. Okay. Uh, in regard to your uh, low flush toilets, uh, have you had any problems with your your uh, utility maintenance, say in your older part of town, uh, where you don't have enough water to move the solids along? And then uh, you get the same problem with, say, infill. You start getting, um, you know, multi uh, or multi housings, you know, three, four stories, and all of a sudden you've got a hundred people where you had four or five before. What kind of problems have you seen with that? I've heard that issue uh, as a potential problem. We have not seen that as a problem. Um, we have an extremely uh, comprehensive flushing program for our sewers. We flush the entire system uh, about every 18 to 20 months, some parts of it more often, and we keep repairing it um, quite a bit. So I have not seen that, although I've heard that as a potential. I've not seen it. Hey, back here. A quick question. I doubt if you can really respond to it very thoroughly. Related to the cost of Zurich, the kind of a broad statement you made that mm -hmm. I would challenge that because there's Please. a lot of levels. Of what? A lot of levels of, of landscaping that you can do, a right. lot of approaches that are Zurich. Right. Um, so I really question that it's as expensive necessarily as you're indicating. Well, the Yardex program looked at it very carefully. They took a variety of uh, yards up and down the front range. They took a third of them, put them in Zurich, a third of them in shrubs and trees, and left a third of it in bluegrass. They were able to reduce water 50% by doing that. If you take that one third that is in Zurich, and you assume that it's three to five dollars a foot, square foot, that's what the numbers come out. Now, if you do it yourself, it's going to be cheaper. But again, it gets into whose pocket is this coming from? Well, well, first of all, if you're comparing planting shrubbery to planting bluegrass, yes, it is more expensive. But that doesn't necessarily mean the shrub is Zurich. I just don't want people to get the impression that uh, doing sensible landscaping is in, uh, expensive. Good point. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I also wondered whether those costs for Zurich were extended over the lifetime of the installation. Probably not. Uh, my understanding is that the cost of Zurich is to maintain is more expensive than bluegrass. That is, it takes more labor to maintain it and to... Um, and you don't pay for it in the water savings. I now, mean, I know I'm going to get into an argument here, <laughs> but that's my understanding. That's uh, where I, I'm coming from. I'm a landscape architect, and uh, I, was a st I graduated from Purdue University in Indiana. I came to Colorado, and I didn't have to learn any new plant material because everybody was planting the same thing <laughs> here as they were in Indiana. Yeah. So for the last 38 years, I've been trying to do different things. And... You know, bluegrass is, if you have bluegrass lawn, you're taking care of it every week. If you, if you do naturalized landscaping and use the right plants in the right place, it's not more work. This is an argument that we are all having. Is there some way of solving it? I mean, is there, should we, the cities, as part of our conservation program, do a study, uh, a controlled study or something? Or has that been done? I don't know. 
but I would really like to nail this one down because it comes up all the time, and I don't know the answer. Okay, one more comment here. Um, when I when I started, I planted three lawns or so. Three. Three, okay. and I, I started them from seed. And I was told that you're supposed to use fescue because that is less water, uh, doesn't use water. But I don't think you can let it die in the summertime like you can bluegrass. Is that true? Let's ask the landscape architect. I here, think that's true. Here, here's what I want to do. I'm going to be yeah. very autocratic here. Okay. Our time is that's gone. Pretty much true. I do know, because I'm married to an irrigation engineer, that bluegrass may take more water to keep it absolutely beautiful, but bluegrass can withstand not having water and bounce back faster than fescue. So I think the point here is that there are no silver bullets um, and that all of these questions we need to look at carefully and not just draw conclusions. I'm still going to support Xeriscape every inch of the way whether it's more costly or not and whether it takes more time to maintain. But that subject, we will close off now. And sure enough, be sure to send your comments about that to John, because I, he is I indeed interested. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martine. And we have 20 minutes to finish up. Thank you. You can go five past seven. OK. So what, what I'm going to do is I, I've got about 10 minutes here just to kind of preview the public forums that we'll be holding on April 11th and April 16th to explain a little bit what we're doing and, and just a bit of the theory. Uh, like a lot of the people that we've been hearing through this whole session is, you know, I, I'd love to have you all in my class for a semester. Um, I wouldn't want to do all the grading. Uh, but but to, to cover what I need to cover, uh, but I'll just kind of touch on some highlights just to give you a sense of things. And then we're also going to do an evaluation of the entire series right afterwards. You, you all have evaluations on your chairs of just tonight, and it gives you a chance to kind of write out some things. Uh, but as I'm talking to make sure we, we honor your time and get you out of here on time, uh, Leah Spray, one of my colleagues, is going to help pass out some of the electronic keypads. Uh, so while I'll, I'll try to talk loud enough so that's not too distracting. Or, and maybe you can have a couple people kind of help her pass those out. I don't know if Caroline, if you can come up and um, as I'm kind of going. So let me pull up. Uh, so my name is Martin Garkson. I'm a communication professor at CSU, and I run the CSU Center for Public Deliberation, which is an organization I started five years ago uh, just to help us have these more difficult conversations. So uh, part of what I do with the center is I train students to be facilitators. Uh, that come through my program and stay for a year and, and through the class to just train how to run small groups and those type of things. So what we'll be doing on April 11th and 16th is I'll be bringing out my students to run small table discussions so you'll be able to talk about these issues that we've been talking about for the last two months uh, with a smaller group and kind of work through this issue. Uh, so for my organization, I really focus on two, two questions. So one is how do we best meaningfully deal with public problems in diverse democracy? Uh, and, and the type of problems we focus on are what we call wicked problems. I talked about this briefly at the first night. Uh, but a wicked problem is, is a particular kind of problem that has lots of features. And I, I spent about three days in class on this, but I'll, I'll spend about 45 seconds. Uh, so one feature is it involves competing underlining values. It inherently has paradoxes. Uh, there's no way to technically solve it uh, because if we push on one end, then it kind of pushes out the other end. Uh, so if you think about the river, some of what we've already been talking about, a lot of what we talked about the first night, uh, is there's lots of things we really care about that are tied to the river and tied to water. Uh, the problem, again, is, is we can't have all these. And, and the more we get of one, typically the less we get of another. Um, and, and, and if growth continues to happen, th these things are even going to get more difficult. Right? So we're inherently dealing with these things that we're kind of going through. Uh, so th those are kind of so that's one of the problems. The other problem is we don't really understand the problem until we try to solve it, because any solution creates new problems. Uh, so the only way to learn about the problem is kind of through trial and error. Dealing with these problems, we don't solve a wicked problem, but you can deal with them a lot better. Or you can uh, one of the phrases that's used in literature is you tackle them. Uh, so some communities can tackle them better than others. Uh, dealing with them typically s requires adaptive changes. It, it, it cha you know, requires us to change the way we do things, the, the way we do showers, for example, or the way we do our lawns, or the way we think about growth and those type of things. Uh, and this is important because it's hard for experts to dictate adaptive changes 
uh, but communities working together can sometimes uh, come up with those adaptive changes and take ownership of them in important ways. Uh, dealing with wicked problems requires collaboration, requires a lot of shared understanding across perspectives, um, and it requires a lot of creativity. So the second question I look at, again, I'm a communication professor, is okay, what kind of communication processes and engagement processes help us deal with these kind of problems? Uh, in our class, we, we talk broadly about kind of three ways of solving problems, uh, that, that, you know, ways of doing politics in a way. Uh, one way is adversarial politics, which is Democrats versus Republicans, or, or activists, or lobbyists, or interest groups, or, or litigation. Um, a second way is expert politics, is let's get a lot of smart people to study it and figure out the problem and kind of let them come up with the solution. Uh, and then what we're the kind of new kid on the block is we're developing deliberative politics, which is about collaboration and working together and typically requires kind of outside facilitation and impartial convener and resource to kind of help us have these conversations. Each of those forms of politics have advantages and disadvantages, and each kind of work in different particular ways. You know, one of the classes I teach at CSU is a, is a social movement class. Um, so certainly adversarial politics have made a lot of important changes in our lives and our important uh, things. Uh, if I had time, I would walk through all the pros and cons of each, and again, they each have pros and cons. But you can kind of think of them as three tools that communities need, and we need kind of all three cool tools in different situations. One of my goals is really to, to provide a, a stronger deliberative tool to our community. Uh, <coughs> If I was just to highlight kind of one kind of uh, issue with each form, the, one of the big problems for adversarial politics, especially from my perspective as a communication professor, is that it typically incentivizes pretty bad communication. Um, what works in adversarial politics, because you know, you're, you're not really trying to convince people that disagree with you of anything, you're trying to you know, build your coalition and get some people in the middle. Uh, so you're inherently incentivizes the kind of messages that work to mobilize people, but not necessarily bring people together. Um, with wicked problems that require collaboration, require us dealing with all these different tensions and trade-offs that go between these things, adversarial politics make it harder for us to work together in a lot of important ways. Uh, so that's one of the reasons with some of these problems that we try to build um, some different tools. Same thing with experts. Experts are critical to help us solve problems, and experts can help us, you know, how do we do these things within each of these circles, but experts aren't as good as telling of which of these are more important. How do we rank these? Uh, there's no expertise that you can develop that, that lists the value. So each of us, you know, we might care about every single one of these, but we would probably rank them very differently. And no expert can tell us what's the right way uh, to rank them. So experts are critical to the process, but they can't take us all the way home when we're making these tough choices as a community. Uh, so deliberative processes are specifically designed in some ways to deal with wicked problems and to take the best from adversarial and expert politics and, and try to avoid or kind of overcome some of the worst. Now, some of the pro drawbacks of deliberative politics is it takes a whole bunch of time, it takes a whole bunch of energy, it takes a whole lot of capacity. It's typically very expensive. Um, hopefully you consider it lucky that you have uh, a center here that does it all for free because we can do it through students. So it creates kind of a win-win situation that the students get some experience, but the community gets more capacity. I can show up to a meeting with 30 trained facilitators um, and, and do it for, for free. Or at least it's coming out of someone's pocket, but the, you know. <laughs> so one theoretical point that I want to make to so make sure we kind of finish this is there's a, a pollster named Daniel uh, Yankelevich uh, who's been doing polls, you know, since, since the 1950s or so. He kind of worked for Gallup and CBS and those organizations. And he started getting really frustrated with his product because he felt that he, he realized when he really looked deeply into these polls uh, that if you ask the same people the same question a little bit later, they answer it differently. Or if you tweak the wording of the question, they give you a completely different answer. Uh, so we started trying to think about how can we say what's, what's good public opinion and bad public opinion just versus op public opinion. Uh, so then he started looking at those people that didn't change their opinion. No matter how you asked them or when you asked them, they stayed stable. Uh, and he figured out what, what those people had done is they really thought through the issue, that they've really owned their opinion, that they've considered all the different points of view, that they've considered particularly the consequences of their points of view, both positive and negative, intended and unintended, uh, and really thought through. Once you've gotten through that place, then no matter what you ask, you have a solid opinion. Uh, so then he started thinking about how do we move people from this kind of surface public opinion to what now he calls public judgment, which is that public opinion that's gone through the process. And this is what he explained. It's a three-stage process. First stage is consciousness raising. That's when we first learn about an issue, right? Uh, so we start forming an opinion about an issue or a problem that we might need to react to. Uh, then ideally we go into a working through stage. Uh, and that's when we're trying to figure out what our opinion is. The early part of the working through stage, reaching for solutions and wishful thinking, it's human psychology. We want things to be easy. 
right? We want it to be good versus evil, and we're the good guys, right? And it makes it, we want a magic bullet. Whether that magic bullet is an easy fix, or whether that magic bullet is a devil figure that stands in the way, if we just get rid of them, everything will be great, right? But if we're doing our work right, we eventually get to the point of we're weighing the choices. We realize we can't have everything, right? We realize we've got to make some tough choices. We realize that no matter what we do, we're going to have some trade-offs. And if we do that right, and we work through those, we weigh the choices and work through the issue, we get to the point of resolution stage that we have a strong opinion, and now we can fight for it and try to get it passed. The other critical point the Yankovich made is we have tons of resources in our culture for stage one and stage three. We have very few for stage two. How many opportunities do we have to learn about a new issue or to pass on our opinion about an issue? Right? The internet is great for that, and bumper stickers is great for that, and t-shirts, and, and, e and email, and Twitter, and Facebook, and all those different things are great for sending out messages once we've figured it out. How many opportunities do we have to really sit down with people that we disagree with and really work through an issue? We have very few cultural resources for that. Right? Uh, so that's, that's part of the idea of the center. My center is part of several different networks, and, and some people call it the deliberative democracy movement, uh, that we realize to solve these problems, we need a better way of doing things. Right? And we need an impartial resource to kind of help shepherd us through some of these and, and give us opportunities to have these tough conversations we need to have to, to really think through these issues. So that's the design of what we'll be doing on April 11th and April uh, 16th, is to give everyone a chance to work through this issue. You've been educated now in the last two months about all these different perspectives, and then we're gonna put you together in a room for two and a half hours in a small group with a facilitator uh, to really think through this. Uh, so National Issues Forum is the model we're using, is the model's been used for about 30 or 40 years, uh, you know, used across the country. I put the website on there if anyone's interested, it's nifi.org. Um, these are the stages that we'll go through. I'm going to go pretty quick here because I don't want to take all over. Uh, so we'll walk through some different steps, and then we're going to set up a framework. This is an example of a framework that we put together for the city of Longmont that ended up winning an award um, from the American Planning Association for Civic Engagement. Uh, but we'll have a set of approaches, right? Um, probably have maybe four or five or so. They're working on that right now. They're going to try to release it at least a week before, so you'll be able to look at uh, it's hard enough to turn all this into kind of six hours, and then we're going to turn it into one page. Right? We're going to have probably legal size, but uh, one page, that will be the, 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 the framework that we'll work from as we're having these conversations. So this is kind of an example for medical marijuana dispensaries, the approaches. This is kind of, I don't expect you to be able to read this, but just kind of has, here's the basic arguments, you know, the, the actions they're, they're asking for, here are the arguments for it, here are the arguments against it. We'll spend dedicated time on each approach to really walk through and think about the appreciations and concerns and, and the consequences of taking those actions and go through. Once we walk through all those approaches, then we'll have some time at the end to kind of reflect and think about some of the other big picture kind of things. Uh, so aspects of this forum, we'll have some ground rules. Some of y'all here the first day saw the ground rules. We'll have the, the frame material like I just showed you, small groups and circles, trained facilitators. My students will also be there taking notes. So we'll, we'll capture all this information, all the data. We'll, be, we'll give you the hard data. We'll also be working on a report, kind of what we learned kind of from this. Experts will be on tap, not on top, which means they'll be there to answer questions. But this is more about what the public can do, which is talking through what's important to us and what consequences we're willing to accept and those type of things. Um, and this is an example of the Brace Colorado workshop that we did of my students working in the, in the small groups um, with all the different groups. Uh, so the goals for the forum, a lot of it is just that opportunity to work through. A lot of our meetings were designed for, for action or they're designed to kind of give decision makers good information. Um, as we kind of heard today, the, the role of the public here is a little bit different than normal, right? That there's other agencies that are making this. We'll, we'll all have another chance at public comment, obviously, uh, towards the end of the year or beginning of next year. Uh, there's certainly actions we can take in terms of conserving and, and, and changing the conversation about growth and all, a lot of those type of things. But a lot of it is going to be more of a chance for, for you to listen to other people about this and you to talk to other people about this. Right? And, and you're perfectly uh, allowed to try to persuade people to your point of view, but you can only do so if you, you, you open yourself up to be potentially persuaded as well, right? It, it kind of goes both ways in a sense. And what we'll be doing, and I'll do this really quickly because we need to move on to the evaluation. Uh, once we have all that data from all the small group conversations, we'll probably do some surveys. We might use the keypads there as well. Uh, so the students and I will, will go through all that information to really kind of identify how do we move this conversation forward, right? What, what's holding us back in certain ways, uh, you know, assumptions that people make and those type of things that we need to kind of work on a little bit more, uh, and what are all these kind of key aspects of deliberation that are going to help us kind of think through and, and hopefully uh, 
be a model community on how to deal with water, which is the idea from the beginning from community foundation uh, of this entire project. Uh, so with that, those, those are the dates that we'll have. Uh, so we have two different, exact same thing both. So we're expecting you to come one or the other, right? You don't need to come to both. Uh, we just want to give two chances for people to come. So with that, does everyone have a keypad? Or I guess I should say, does anyone not have a keypad? That'll be a little easier. Okay, so we got one in the back. I don't know if it gets, get her one. Switch it, okay. So keypads are really easy. All you should have to do is kind of push the button. Some of them you can only answer one question. I mean, you can only pick one answer, and some you can pick as many as you, as you want, and I'll tell you kind of which is it. Uh, if, there's a, if there's a number 10, you just press zero. You don't have to press one and zero, right? And if you change your mind, it will just kind of keep your last one. So we've got a couple of demographic questions. I think we have 13 questions in all, so it shouldn't take too long once y'all get used to it. Uh, but this is a, a primarily evaluating the series overall. Uh, and if <coughs> some of the text is small just to fit the questions, so if you have uh, trouble hearing, feel, feel free to kind of stand up and get a little closer to a TV. Uh, so how many years young are you? And you'll see on the top is how many responses. So we're over 75 at 80 or so, so we'll, we'll kind of set it with this first one and then we'll see how fast we can kind of get through these questions. We're already running late, so unfortunately we won't have too much time to talk through the answers, uh, but I numbered them all. If you have any questions or comments that you want to write something about the answer, feel free to do that in the back of your evaluation, um, or I'll be here afterwards if you want to come talk. So it looks like it's settled, what, 91? Okay. Going once, going twice, 92. <laughs> and, oh wait, I'm about to press it over here. All right, so there we go. Yeah. So no, and we'll we'll put this on the website as soon as possible. Should be up on the university, uh, the community foundation website tomorrow. We'll just throw the data up there if you're interested. Um, so where do you live? So we had two others. If you're if you're comfortable, what are the others? What do we miss? I'm Denver. Oh, Denver. Okay. Okay, two Denvers. Okay. Uh, so which sessions did you attend? So this one you can pick as many as possible. This is kind of a trick question because everyone should pick four, right? Uh, but what, tell us which of the other ones you came to as well. So three people did not attend tonight that were able to pick a question. <laughs> that's good. I, ha I have some of those students in my regular classes too, so that's okay. Right. Uh, I know it's kind of the same question, but it allows us to capture this information a little bit more quickly instead of going through the information. So how many of the sessions did you attend? kind of a mix around. Do you plan on attending one of the forums in April? Going once, going twice. All right. All right, so we're going to ask this question twice. First time, you can pick as many as you want. The second time, you're going to have to just pick one, right? Uh, so let me read it just in case some people can't, can't see it well. So what do you value about the Poudre River? And we pulled these from the initial comments that we got the first night, the handwritten comments, that they're all, there's like a 30-page document posted online of all those comments. We typed them up and gave them back to you. Uh, and, and Leah put these together for us. So it, it contributes to the sense of place in Fort Collins. It enhances local businesses. It should be a wild river with healthy ecosystems. It provides recreational opportunities. It supports local agriculture. It supplies municipal water needs and then other. So a lot across the board. So the, the number one was it supplies municipal water needs, which was number, number six, got 81 votes. And then what, recreational opportunity, local agriculture, 77 each. Um, okay. If we had time, I'd really love to hear some of the others, but I really want to get you out of here. We're already kind of right at time. Um, so I'd love if the, this is question seven, you know, write some of the others on, on the back of your evaluation sheet. I'd love to see those. Uh, so now, same question, but you only get to pick one. So what's most important to you? Okay. So number one is it should be a wild river with healthy ecosystems to supplies water, municipal water needs. And then same thing, we got two questions again. In making decisions about the Poudre River, I'm concerned with how decisions will impact and again, for this one, you can pick as many as you want, and then we're going to ask again, you just get to pick one. So it looks like number one was the first, future generations, and second was a river and repairing the ecology. And same thing, I'd love for you to write some of the other on the back um, that you didn't have up there. And then same question, but now you just get to pick one. Okay. So getting going there. All right, so this is a little bit more. 
focused here instead of across the board. And again, this is, this is part of the theory, again, asking the two questions, right? We all care a lot about all of them, but then you know, some of us kind of rank them differently, and that's part of what we need to work through together as a community. All right, so then the, these last few ones are just kind of basic uh, evaluation questions. So the education series overall, so every night that you came put together, this is the same question we've been asking individually of each session, but this one we're just asking uh, overall. Right, 90. Education series, did it exceed your expectations or did it fall short? <coughs> So this one you get to pick all that apply to you. There is kind of the first four and then the last two asking a little bit different, so you might want to at least answer uh, two of those. Uh, so did you feel that the series was, was balanced or not? Or did you feel that it was biased to, to any particular perspective? And the last two questions, do you feel that it promoted a broad range or more of a narrow range? So another one, I would love to have more time to talk through this, especially if you're, you know, depending on what you're answering here. Uh, so adding that to the back or coming up and talking to us afterwards. So majority certainly felt that it was pretty balanced with, with some concerns in there. I think this might be the last one, maybe two more. Um, so overall this series. Is that it? Oh, one more, okay. <laughs> Uh, so this is what you're interested in moving forward. Uh, and again, you could pick more in one of these if they're relevant to you. And that's the last one. So a lot of interest in more. Um, so with that, we want to honor your time. We apologize for going about five minutes over. I do think we all owe a, another round of applause to Mary Lou for putting all this together and all this work that she's been doing. We can switch it back to this way. Um, with that, we thank you once again for, for spending your valuable time with us, and we hope to yeah. see a lot of y'all in April for the, for the forums. Thank you all so very, very much, and I look forward to seeing you. And we'll collect these at the door. They're very expensive, and we don't want you to go home with them. <laughs>